microbes have been around for a long time, much longer than our understanding of them has been around. Uh, it's thought that they're the ancestors of life on Earth. And our modern ecosystem is really entirely dependent on their activities. So if we were ever successful in our antimicrobial efforts, we would all essentially die. How big are they really? How many cells are in the human body? Of these options, what would you say? That is correct. I wish that this was a game show and you all would just want a lot of money. Typical human cell is 10 to 30 microns. And just to give you a sense of scale, what that would really look like, if this is one millimeter, this is about 10 microns. So they're small. Now there's quite an enormous range of size in the microbial world. Um, human cells, as I said, 10 to 30 microns. An E. coli cell is one micron. A flu virus is 0.1 micron. Uh, the largest eukaryotic cells are about a million times larger than the smallest viruses. And so here's just an electron, scanning the electron EM uh, of the head of a pin where you can see that it's coated with bacterial cells. I actually do want to show this one um, site to you. It's pretty simple. It's fun. If you have kids, they will enjoy this a lot. <clears throat> so if we just zoom in on the head of the pin, we will encounter a hair followed by a dust mite, followed by that big neon green thing is pollen. What's this red thing? Red blood cell. What's that if that's a red blood cell? If this is a red blood cell? White blood cell. Yay. This is a yeast that makes our, some of our food. Down here, what do you think these guys are? This is a caucus-shaped bacteria and a bacillus-shaped bacterium. Smaller than a bacterium, what do you think you see next? Virus. Now, what you can see is two different sizes of viruses. Here is a really big one. It's got this very distinctive staph shape. It's actually Ebola. And these guys, rhinoviruses, one of the colds. One of the colds uh, that we get, colds are caused by actually several different viruses. That's one of them. <clears throat> okay, so there's quite a size range even within groups. So bacteria have been found in the, in the 90s, surprisingly, that are nearly uh, a millimeter in size and can be seen by the naked eye, whereas there are some eukaryotic cells, which normally are 10 microns, uh, that are actually a tenth of that size, so about the size of a bacterial cell. So how do all we know this stuff since they're, it's really difficult to see? It's only been a couple of hundred years. Before that time, we had actually no clue that this was going on. And I will say, I will provide the caveat that uh, we don't know for sure, having not been able to talk to the ancient Egyptians in previous cultures, that there, weren't, there wasn't some understanding of microbes that is as sophisticated as what we have now. But in sort of recent recorded history, it's only been the last couple of centuries where we've understood what's out there. And this really came about, if you've taken bio before, you're familiar with this guy, Robert Hooke, who in the mid-1600s, looking at dead cells, dead plant cells, cork, saw little boxes he called cells and reasoned that, that this was something that originally was living in biological. Um, a decade later, Antony van Leeuwenhoek, who was making microscopes as a hobby. So imagine the present day, you're normally selling curtains, but you know, just as a hobby, you make a really advanced cutting edge technology. That's what was going on at that time. And he saw in his uh, fairly, what we would call primitive microscopes today, uh, these living, moving things that were really tiny. So he was the first person to actually observe living cells. 
In the mid-1800s, Rudolf Virchow was the first person to come up with the theory of biogenesis, in which he said all living things are composed of cells and come from pre-existing cells. And this is a concept that we pretty much accept now, but which was very, very controversial at the time. And for a, quite a long time, there was this vigorous debate because people had assumed for a long time that life could arise spontaneously, which just came as a sort of commonsensical notion from watching decaying matter from which arose things like maggots and flies. And um, <clears throat> there was this alternate now competing idea of biogenesis, which again, we take for granted and was really hotly debated at the time, which is that living organisms arise from life and can't just come out of nothing. So a bunch of the key experiments that were done, this is science in motion, mid 1600s, Francesco Reddy was looking at, he was trying to test this theory, these two theories basically, and he filled three jars uh, with meat and covered that with a fine net and three jars he left open. And he saw no maggots in the one that was covered with a fine net. So basically he reasoned that the maggots were coming from where? They were coming from the air and specifically from flies. So again, the maggots were arising from a living source. The sealed jars or the, the netted jars, the purpose of that was what? To keep out the flies. So this is a support. The result here supports which of these ideas? Biogenesis. And that's what he was hoping to see because he didn't buy the whole spontaneous generation idea. <clears throat> So about 100 years later, John Needham, so this debate is still going on, 100 years later, it's still going on. John Needham wanted to test this again, so he put boiled nutrient broth into covered flasks. The heated nutrient broth was then placed into a sealed flask, and it grew. It grew stuff. Where did the microbes come in the sealed flask? There was still air inside the flask. Now, remember, at this time they didn't know if there was stuff besides air in the air. This was used to, to support which of these ideas? Spontaneous generation. So there's just air. You can't see anything. It's not like there was a fly buzzing around in there or some giant rhinoceros. It's just nutrient broth that was heated, supposedly sterilized. And this, in fact, this was what this guy was hoping to show, because he didn't buy the whole biogenesis idea. So then, not very long after that, 20 years later, we have Spellanzani comes along and he instead, um, he puts nutrient broth in a flask, heats it and seals it, and sees no growth. So which of, this, which of these theories does this support? Biogenesis. So these kind of conflict, they contradict each other. There must be something different in the way that they set up these experiments, which there was. But Really, that detail was overlooked at the time, and still the controversy is going on. We have this, ex and this happens in labs all the time, by the way, testing more advanced ideas where you get this result in lab one and this result in lab two. Probably it's because these guys use different flavored water, but we don't know that. We have to keep testing this using more sophisticated experiments. So some of the people argued that heating destroyed some sort of vital force in the air that was necessary for spontaneous generation. And what I will tell you about the difference between these two experiments was <clears throat> that this nutrient broth was heated and then it was put in a sealed flask, whereas this flask was already um, essentially sealed while it was heated. So the idea was that the air that was inside of it was destroyed somehow by the heating process. So that meant that there had to be some way to allow air to flow in and out of this experiment in order to test this idea. So in 1861, Louis Pasteur, which most of us recognize uh, is a really important force in microbiology. In fact, he's considered the founder of modern microbiology. He made these special flasks. So he had a flask, he poured in the nutrient broth, he heated it, and he also, uh, using heat, he pulled the neck of the flask down to a, an S shape. And what this allowed him to test was whether it was really air itself. So air is able to flow freely in and out. It's not being heated and killed, right? It's able to freely flow in and out. But if there was something in the air, maybe something alive, then as the air was flowing in and out, it would get caught in this flask 
uh, S-shaped neck. And indeed, what he saw was when he did this part of the experiment and left the flask open in the air but prevented something that maybe was slightly heavier from getting inside, it, was, it, ma it maintained its sterility. Nothing grew. And in fact, these flasks are still on display in a museum and they still are not contaminated. On the other hand, if you broke off the neck of the flask and just let it to sit open to the air, it did grow things. So what does that experiment support? It's a very compelling argument for biogenesis and strongly refutes the idea that you can spontaneously generate life. Now, I will say, ironically, that many years later, people who are trying to understand how life came about on Earth in the first place proposed a theory of spontaneous generation. But that requires that the conditions of the early Earth be much different than they are now. Now, whether or not you buy that, I personally do, but I'm open to lots of options. Um, it does it require a sophisticated understanding of chemistry, and a lot of the steps in that spontaneous generation theory are, uh, some of them have individually been proven and can be shown in a laboratory, but not all of them in sequence. So we haven't been able to spontaneously generate new life. Now, despite the experiment that I just described, these results were not um, completely convincing, and one of the reasons is they weren't reproducible. And again, this happens in science all the time. This guy, John Tyndall, in 1870, uh, sort of made a connection that other people had not, which is that in the experiments where it was working, the, past, the sort of uh, stereotypical Pasteur experiment where you sterilize these S-shaped flasks and indeed nothing grows, whereas other people did a similar experiment and things did grow, the actual components of the nutrient broth were different. So in the experiments where this worked, there was sugar and yeast. In the experiments where it failed, there was hay. And hay, it turns out, contains heat-resistant microbes. These are called um, endospores. So in 1876, this German botanist actually discovered endospores that had sort of been proposed uh, in in theory, and he did show that they were heat resistant. And now endospores are really important for us because one of the species that can make us really sick causes botulism, and it creates endospores that are resistant to heating, so you have to do special things when you're canning in order to prevent botulism. <coughs> Shortly after this, we have what we consider the golden age of microbiology. So a series of decades, beginning with Pasteur's work, in which a lot of discoveries were made because people then began to accept the basic premises of biogenesis and microbes existing, and there was a relationship established between microbes and disease. This allowed people to then develop ways to prevent disease by understanding microbes, and ultimately uh, began a whole new field of immunology. So one of the things that's really fun is that Pasteur had his hand in a lot of pies, and one of the things that he was able to show, people uh, had been using the ability of microbes to do fermentation in order to make things that we like for quite a long time. So you can look back quite a long time and look at all sorts of things that have sugar in them, like fruit, for instance, or ve some vegetables, and you add microbes to them, you can produce alcohol. What microbe in particular do you add, generally speaking? Yeast. Now, some of the time what happens, unfortunately, is that this alcohol spoils. And Pasteur figured out that it was another microbe that was causing this change from alcohol into vinegar, acetic acid, and it was bacteria rather than yeast that were doing that process. Some bacteria use alcohol as a food, basically, and produce acetic acid as a waste product. And so he developed a method to prevent spoilage by allowing the yeast to do their work and create the alcohol that we want, and then briefly heating it to kill the bacteria. And this was called pasteurization. And basically, it was an application of high heat for a fairly short time, and now we have industrial pasteurization, which usually is a higher heat for a shorter time. Tyndallization is a slightly different procedure, which is required to destroy endospores. 
And this is important, as I said, in making canned food to prevent botulism. One of the other key things to come out of this golden age is the germ theory of disease. So in 1835, this guy named Agostino, Agostino Bassi showed that a silkworm disease was caused by a fungus. And so 50, or, uh, 30 years later, Pasteur showed another silkworm disease was caused by a different uh, organism, but, but a microbe, a uh, protozoan. And then 15 years later, Joseph Lister, who was a battlefield surgeon, applied this understanding that microbes can cause disease, which up until now had just been sort of seen in um, agriculture, to sort of understand that microbes might be in the air and could cause human disease. And because of this, and because of his understanding of what actually was happening, empirical observations that people who were in medicine that touched a lot of patients, uh, that resulted in disease spreading in the patient population. He made the connection that if we could actually clean the hands of the surgeons, we would prevent this kind of transmission. He pioneered the use of chemical disinfection using phenol, which was the disinfectant at the time, to prevent surgical wound infection. And again, this is something that we take for granted now. We think, well, of course you have to wash your hands if you're a surgeon. Of course you should apply disinfectants to wounds after surgery. But this was a new idea. So just imagine, if you haven't already, all of the time that had elapsed up until this point where people were cutting each other open or cutting off limbs because they had been injured in battle or delivering babies and not understanding that unseen living organisms can cause disease and what kind of havoc that would create. A really um, important part of the understanding of disease was developed by Robert Koch in 1876. So he showed that anthrax, which is a very common disease, was caused by a bacterium. Who knows the name of this bacterium, by the way? It's a bacillus. The next part should be really easy. Bacillus anthracis. So he um, showed that, and as a result of his work, he developed a series of steps in order to generically show that a particular organism causes a particular disease. And these were called coast postulates, postulates. And it was it sort of became the standard, which allowed people to track down which things were causing what diseases, which until that point had really not been well understood. Of course, this particular organism and this disease have, which traditionally was a livestock disease, it has become famous. Why? Why has it been in the news? It's part of bi like bioterrorism, right? This is a sort of big fear that people will use anthrax widely to kill a lot of people. And this was recently attempted, right? Which is why a lot of mail carriers and people who sort mail now wear gloves, which you never saw before. Because somebody put a bunch of anthrax into envelopes and mailed it. Um, during this time, we also see uh, the development of vaccination. Now, this actually began in the late 1700s. Edward Jenner, uh, you may know, at the time, and for many, many hundreds of years, the human population has been plagued with smallpox. And so it was a, a really important thing to try and deal with. And he had noticed that uh, milkmaids who had previously contracted the relatively less harmful cowpox were immune to smallpox. So he inoculated someone with cowpox on purpose and subsequently observed they were protected from smallpox. Would we be able to get away with this experiment today? No, probably not, okay. Um, but he developed this technique, and so consequently, when it became a more widespread technique later on, it was dubbed vaccination in honor of that initial uh, experiment. But this protection that he, he developed initially was called immunity. Now, I want to actually mention this term chemotherapy, because we associate chemotherapy largely with what disease? It's cancer. Um, but chemotherapy actually has a broader definition. That's with treatment with chemicals. So in a sense, a lot of the things that we do in medicine are chemotherapy, 
therapies. Um, so basically, chemotherapeutics are used to treat infectious disease, and they can be synthetic drugs or antibiotics. And of course, chemotherapeutics can be used to treat non-infectious disease like cancer. But that term actually covers a broad range of things. Now, antibiotics are distinct from synthetic drugs. Antibiotics are chemicals that are produced by organisms, bacteria and fungi. And they do that in nature in order to kill each other. Why do they do that? Why would you think that they would do that? If you've heard of this famous experiment where, um, you know, the, the fungus was growing on the plate of bacteria and the scientists noticed it and look, it's killing. But why is that happening? We're in microbiology, so we want to think like a microbe. Sure, I mean, maybe one of them wants to kill and eat the other one. The most common reason is because they actually both are competing for the same resources. And the one that can kill off the other one's going to win, which is actually pretty human, right? We have all sorts of wars going on all the time for resources. The microbial world is no different. So the first synthetic drugs, um, the, there's, you know, plenty of uh, sort of treatments that people have developed over many hundreds of years that come from na or natural extracts of plants and roots. Um, one example is the malaria remedy quinine, which is a tree bark extract. But synthetic drugs, people going about deliberately making something that requires a little bit of chemistry, is a fairly new innovation. And the uh, first synthetic drug is credited to Paul Ehrlich, who thought you know, based on all this stuff that we're learning about microbiology, perhaps there would be some way to kill the microbes that cause disease without also hurting the host. And this is actually kind of a neat idea that's not completely intuitive and, and comes, is still something we struggle with today. And if you think back to cancer, the chemotherapies that we use specifically for cancer often have bad side effects, right? Why is that? Sure, there's all these side effects that can weaken your immune system. They kill off red blood cells. They make you nauseated because they irritate the lining of your stomach. Your hair falls out. Why is it happening? What are cancer cells? Human cells have gone bad. So you're actually trying to kill a human cell. It may be a very bad human cell that's behaving inappropriately, but it's still a human cell, and the things you're trying to target are probably pretty similar to the other things that are already happening in your body. If we think about things like bacteria and viruses, well, the good news is those are structurally and chemically different from us. So it is actually possible to do sometimes develop things that would kill them that are harmless to us. So he uh, was the first person to develop this synthetic drug, Salversan, in 1910, that was used to treat syphilis that was a derivative of arsenic. And in, 20 years later, people made a whole bunch of things. Sulfur drugs came from that effort. So here is uh, the advent of antibiotics in the beginning of the 1900s. Alexander Fleming noticed this fungus growing on his bacterial plates and figured that there must be something this fungus was making. It turned out to be a chemical made by the fungus called penicillin. It became one of the first antibiotics. It wasn't until the 40s that it was clinically tested and mass produced. So do you need to know all this stuff? Yes, I think you already know that. Uh, but just to give you an idea, do I care about the specific dates? Do you need to memorize them? You don't. You should have a general idea of the order in which they happened. But really, I want you to understand the contributions made by the important players along the road to uh, developing the field of microbiology. What is their unique contribution? You should know that. So one of the ways you can look at what kind of question I might ask is to look at the matching section at the end of chapter one. I also want you to understand the logic behind experiments that I showed you well enough to use them in a short answer question. Um, you don't need to know this, but this is just to show you some of the Nobel Prizes that have been uh, given for advances in um, microbiology. <coughs> 
We, of course, have a number of fields of study that are branching off now from microbiology. Bacteriology is the study of bacteria. Mycology is the study of fungus. Virology is the study of viruses. Parasitology is the study of protozoa and parasitic worms. Um, also, if a, in a Venn diagram, some overlap between microbiology and immunology, which is a relatively new field, is the study of immunity that was pioneered by uh, these vaccinations that people were doing. Uh, we now know that there are interferons that our cells make that help us to combat viral disease. And one of the key players in this field that I do want you to remember in the 30s, Rebecca Lampfield, was really key in understanding the different subtypes of streptococcuses that can make us sick. Uh, other fields that sort of we will delve into a little bit, microbial genetics is the study of how microbes inherit traits, so they're, uh, how they pass on genetic information. My field, molecular biology, which is basically the study of how DNA directs protein synthesis. And the fairly new field of genomics this is the study of whole genomes, which has only been possible because we actually now have sequences of whole genomes, which we didn't have before. And this has been really, really interesting and uh, caused us to re-examine the relationships that we thought existed between different species. So <clears throat> microbes are useful, not just in the ecological world, but we manipulate them all the time for science for uh, bioremediation, for pest control, and producing things that we want. Microbes in my field are used as biological models. And so this is possible because, like us, bacteria are made of cells. They're composed of all the same chemical elements, as we'll talk about on Thursday. They use and replicate DNA, so the machinery that does that is similar. They make proteins, just like we do, and they have the same kind of metabolism. Microbes are helpful in treating wastewater, sewage treatment, very important, relies on bacterial, um, bacteria's ability to degrade things. Sometimes we can use bacteria to clean up spills. Uh, it is not a perfected science, I will say, at this time. So an oil spill in the ocean is still a big deal. We sometimes can use microbes as a pest control, as an alternative to a chemical pest. So microbes that are pathogenic to insects can um, help prevent crop damage. And one of the most common players in this field is Bacillus thuringiensis that kills many insects but is not harmful to us. For many hundreds of years, microbes have been really important in food production. Um, and in fact, if you look in the ancient Egyptian uh, hieroglyphics, there's actually a hieroglyph for beer which uh, suggests that yeast was being used for a long time. Nowadays, of course, we have a sort of mass production of things that people used to do on a small scale. So the making of yogurt and cheese has gone from really tiny um, farms to huge factories. Biotechnology is a field in which we use bacteria to synthesize things, a whole laundry list of chemicals, uh, sometimes antibiotics, or uh, dietary supplements can also be synthesized by microbes. And you know, some of these are compounds the microbes make already. So you just find an, an organism that's already making acetone or is already making something useful that you want, and you just grow a lot of that. Provide it with the things it needs to live, it spits out the things you want. But nowadays, thanks to our understanding of DNA, you can take DNA, which is the instructions for making protein, and you want some particular protein machine, maybe you want insulin, maybe you want hemoglobin, maybe you want some sort of antibiotic that's a protein, and you put that instruction into the microbe. It's not a gene that that microbe normally would ever use in nature, but in the controlled conditions of the lab, you can make a whole bunch of what you need. Insulin, in particular, used to be made from pigs. Now you can make it in the bacterium. If we go back out into the wild, the main purpose of bacteria is to take things like carbon and nitrogen and phosphate uh, and various nutrients, sulfur, that we need but exist in nature in forms that we can't use. They combine those elements and chemicals into things that we actually can use. 
it's important to recognize that the microbial world is really by far the vast majority of a species on Earth. So when people are thinking about biodiversity, we're sort of a little bit species-centric in this way. We think about mammals first, maybe we think about the fish, we think about the insects, but a lot of people overlook the contribution of microbes, even people who are doing a lot of policy, and that's kind of a mistake. Uh, they may be at the bottom, but they are certainly fundamental. Now, one of the reasons that this is uh, a problem is that, or the reason that this is the case is that it is actually hard to get a sense of how many microbes are out there because most of them cannot be grown and studied in a lab very easily. And that's because they just live in settings that we haven't, uh, where the conditions are so extreme it's very difficult to simulate them in a lab. The other thing that's true about microbes in the wild is that unlike the organisms we'll handle in plants, which are pure cultures, one species, they have you know, very homogeneous features. In the real world, microbes are not alone. They live in huge communities of many species that uh, have a complex relationship to each other. And biofilms are important because they colonize um, our bodies. So in your mouth, you have a biofilm. They colonize your plumbing. A lot of the times when you have a clog in your pipes, it's a biofilm. And they also colonize things that you would like to stay sterile before they go into the human body, like medical implants. <clears throat> so we also know that we have a lot of uh, microbes in our bodies. These are normal and, generally speaking, either harmless or essential. The suite of those organisms is called microbiota. And uh, when they're the microbes that are there normally, that don't really cause us any harm, we call them no normal microbiota. They have a lot of important functions. So if you were able to uh, antibacterially scrub your insides and outsides, you would get rid of some important features. One of the things that these guys do is that they sit in places that microbes like to grow and they prevent pathogens from growing there. So when you are exposed to something that would make you sick, then generally that guy is already at a disadvantage because all of the real estate is already occupied by existing uh, microbiota. Some of them, in addition to just sort of taking up space and fending off invaders, produce important things like vitamins that we need. And they also, of course, increase our resistance to disease. We've already covered this, and I think that the answers we t discussed in the beginning were excellent. So basically, you all already passed this course and you can go home. Uh, but it's very true that while in some settings it's important to carefully clean medical instruments, you know, there's a lot of stuff in a hospital, so it's probably a good idea to sterilize your hands between patients. If you're a nurse, you probably want to use that. Um, hand cleaning solution if you're visiting a sick person in the hospital, it would be a good idea. If you're in your house and everybody's healthy, then you really just can use soap and water and be just fine. <clears throat> so let's talk about infectious diseases, which although it's the minority of the things that microbes do, is nonetheless important And if you're not feeling well, then you feel especially um, you feel a special relationship with the pathogenic members of the microbial world. So human pathogens kill a lot more people than we kill each other, amazingly, despite our own incredibly efficient efforts at this. And they have been used as weapons recently in bioterrorism. In addition to the pathogens that we've lived with for literally thousands of years. There are some emerging infectious diseases, and uh, these are new diseases or diseases that used to be rare or are in, in increasing in, in incidence. Some of the diseases that we used to deal with that are no longer a problem include smallpox. So viral smallpox has literally been at least 4,000 years with the human population and caused at least 10 million deaths when it encounters a population of people that have no previous exposure historically, it completely decimates those people, right? And so it's this famous example of um, migration from the old world to this continent, uh, which brought smallpox with it, which was endemic. 
and some of the people had some immunity that were arriving here. Unfortunately, the people that already lived here did not. This has been um, a target of efforts to eradicate disease, and in 1977, it was considered basically eliminated. Now, since then, there have been one or two scattered reports. There are still stockpiles of smallpox, but by and large, this is considered the major triumph of international efforts and cooperation to eliminate disease, and it's considered a model. Um, what is, that's heartening, but what is important to recognize are two things. First of all, not all diseases are disamenable to eradication. Smallpox is something that there was a fairly straightforward and pretty long, well understood means by which you could inoculate and prevent it. Not all diseases have such an easy solution. Um, if you consider, for instance, HIV, we don't still have a, a very effective means to prevent it. We still don't have like super effective treatments that aren't really expensive. And so it's, despite many years of effort, still quite a difficult um, problem. The second thing is that there are many worldwide diseases that have simple cures. And for various reasons, we have not managed to eradicate them. They would respond really well to things as simple as having access to clean water and sanitation. Uh, typically, those diseases are found in places, which is the vast majority of the world, that are pe where people are living in poverty and um, are being affected by things like war or uh, by the unfortunate side effects of industrialization. So if we look at the plague, uh, which you've probably heard of, there's a major killer in the course of history, and particularly uh, in Europe, between 1346 and 1350, 25 million people died. I mean, that's a huge number of people. Now today, this is actually still around. But only about 100 people die around the world every year. And the major effort that was done there was to control the rodent population, which is the reservoir of, this, um, of the organism that causes this disease. The other thing is that it's a bacterium. And so once you know that it's a bacterium, and once you have the kind of technology, to, it, it's fairly simple, right, to treat a bacterial infection. You just use antibiotics. So even when you get sick with this, if your control of the rodent population is insufficient, to prevent you from being exposed to it. As long as you live in a place that has antibiotics available, you're still good. <clears throat> so let's talk about what we still need to do. There's a lot of disease out there that still uh, needs to be addressed. And viruses, as well as diseases associated with poverty, are pretty much at the top of the list. Most of the illness and death worldwide is from respiratory infections and diarrhea. And that's sobering when you think about the fact that this is pretty much something that almost never kills you in this country. <clears throat> in the United States, there are uh, roughly 200 deaths from these kinds of diseases, and that costs us a lot of money, but worldwide it's a much bigger problem. If we think about the diseases that are becoming, that are on, sort of on the rise, uh, we have Everyone's heard of the bird flu, in particular the strain called H5N2. So that's a case where uh, influenza has sort of hopped from one species to another. And we'll talk about the structure of influenza in a future lecture, but that will help you to understand why this particular virus does that. It's not that common for viruses to do that, actually. And probably if you're in the healthcare field, you're familiar with MRSA and possibly with VRSA, which are uh, Staphylococcus aureus infections that have become resistant to uh, various levels of antibiotics. So in the 50s, uh, the Staph aureus that was endemic in most human populations became resistant to penicillin because of the wide use of penicillin. Subsequently, in the 80s, MRSA developed, which is resistant to the next drug that was being used, methicillin, and now we have uh, strains that are resistant to vancomycin. <laughs> so this illustrates that even though we now understand a lot about disease, and thankfully we have antibiotics to treat it, the microbes are sneaky. 
they want to live too. So they can out evolve us in some cases. You've certainly heard of West Nile virus that causes West Nile encephalitis. We had a, already a mention of mad cow disease, which is a prion disease. Although E. coli is beneficial to us, there are some strains that cause disease, including O157H7 that causes uh, diarrhea. <coughs> of course, we already had a look at our friend Ebola over here, which causes hemorrhagic fever, and AIDS, which is a big problem worldwide. You may have also heard of swine flu, SARS, TB, of course, that is especially difficult dangerous um, because of its ability to develop multiple drug resistance, Lyme disease, hepatitis, and hantavirus. These are just some examples. So here are the places in the world where we're seeing uh, emerging diseases continue to arise. <coughs> now why is this happening? So partly it's because we change our lifestyle. And as we move into new territory, we'll become in contact with animals or other species which may have viruses or other kinds of diseases that we haven't previously been exposed to. So example, for instance, hantavirus. What is the natural host of hantavirus? Anybody know? Some rodents, yeah. So it's normally in that population and we are not a natural host of hantavirus. <coughs> Ebola is another example. It's a very, very serious disease and with a very high death rate and a pretty gruesome and rapid end. Uh, it is not a normally endemic human disease. You don't see it sort of sweeping through the world every couple of months the way the flu does. Now, what's difficult about those kinds of diseases that sort of appear for the first time in the human population, because we have no relationship with that organism, we don't have any kind of coevolution that has allowed us to develop defenses against it. I'm just going to check where we are in this. Great, we're almost at the end. Perfect. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, these new emerging diseases often are the result of a disease that's crossing a species barrier. Bird and swine flu came from other animals, uh, as did SARS, and HIV is thought to have originated uh, from monkeys in the in parts of Africa. So we have also this category of re-emerging diseases. These are diseases that used to be well controlled or weren't that common, and now they're getting more common. <clears throat> One of the major reasons this can happen is declining vaccination rate. And what hap what's interesting about this is that if you, for instance, lived in a time when most people were vaccinated against polio, um, or that disease was well controlled by sanitation, and you're not really used to seeing people be affected by it, then the idea of taking something like a vaccine or a drug or doing something it can seem more fear, fearsome, especially with the uh, use of the right propaganda, more so than the disease because you've never actually experienced it or seen anyone with that illness. And measles, mumps, and the whooping cough, for instance, which used to be really common in the U.S. and are extremely well controlled by vaccination. Um, there's lots of people now that didn't grow up with those diseases and don't really think of them as being so terrible. And so uh, this sort of controversy around vaccination can kind of tip the scales and make you think, well, it's far more dangerous to take a vaccine, which may or may not have some bad side effects in some small number of people, than to face a possible uh, increase in the rise of this disease. And we can have that discussion later on. But that's one reason, as you can see, declining vaccination rates, even in countries with a lot of resources and plenty of uh, public education where pr prior to that point the disease had been well controlled. <coughs> Pathogens can also develop resistance. Of course, we've talked about TB, right, can develop multiple drug resistance. Malaria, unfortunately, which we prior previously were able to control by spraying pesticides on all the mosquitoes, we can discuss whether or not that's a good idea, but 
Mosquitoes can then develop resistance to the pesticides, and now you have a rise in the malaria. And of course, we talked about just recently another example of pathogens developing drug resistance, which is what? Something you see in the hospital frequently. Versa and versa, right? Also, as people move around the country more or around the world, they may mix, populations may mix, so this population might have some endemic illness but has some kind of resistance to it versus that one, and they, they trade some diseases and um, consequently you can get transmission that wasn't there before or that had been well controlled. And so this happens, you'll often see cases of something arising in the U.S. that was accidentally imported from Eastern Europe, for instance, or from uh, parts of Asia. Also, changes in demographics may alter who is uh, uh, sort of available for different pathogens. And finally, and this is not a bad thing, but it certainly can change your stat, changes in understanding and diagnosis can uh, cause something that was previously considered to be rare to be now more common because it's been better uh, identified. So we're now what you might consider to be in the second golden age of microbiology uh, because we now understand that the vast majority of the microbes on Earth are not well studied. And this is because of sequencing. So if you take a sample out of the Bermuda Triangle, for instance, uh, you'll find there's, by sequencing, you'll realize, oh my gosh, there's 2,000 new bacterial species in this sample that no one's ever, ever looked at all of whom might have some important use in industry, medicine, or science. And so that's exciting. And it may be that the next few decades hold a lot of interesting discoveries. 